Welcome. Today we're on the road here on the beautiful campus of Houston Baptist University in Houston, Texas, in this gorgeous hall, Beelan Chapel. I'm Danny Jones, and I'm here with Ethan Ahmad and Dr. Brady Spitz, who is professor of percussion here at HBU. Today, Ethan Ahmad will be performing the TMEA Four Mallet Etude entitled Mystic Fire by Julie Davila. Listen, learn, and enjoy. So today we're talking about Mystic Fire by Julie Davila. This is a really great selection because it has a bunch of different sections in it. So you have to demonstrate a few different feels and a few different characters. So the opening is just kind of a riff on descending thirds in F minor. My main piece of advice for the beginning is just um, try this sticking on the little fills. I would go one, two, three, one. Okay, um, and you can try that again when it comes back up the octave. So that you have a consistent sticking and approach wherever you are on the instrument. Uh, speaking of where you are on the instrument, I found already with uh, several of my students that they get really excited and stand right next to where they start. And that makes sense. Um, however, you're about to have to play up here and if you're not in a position that allows you to easily reach there, you might, wanna, you might end up doing one of those weird stutter steps up the instrument, which I try to avoid. I really wanna li limit my lower body involvement generally. It's just another variable that you have to think about. So if you get that variable out of the equation, it's a little simpler. And then when you get to this transition measure, you're still kind of in place, you don't have to do any sort of shuffle. Now the bottom of that first page, there's this cool breakdown of a permutation. The permutation is one, four, two, three. Right? Um, and we're just gonna start in 16th notes and continue that, but we're gonna go to triplets. So that's how I would practice it. If this is a bit of a um, tricky spot for you as it is for a lot of students, I would practice five beats only. So, if you can find one lolly two, you'll probably be able to set yourself up for the rest of the measure. If you're just thinking, oh, it's the same permutation and it slows down, it's gonna be very proximate in your rhythm. So set yourself up with that first note, with that first beat rather, and just carry that through. And if you're still having trouble, um, go ahead and take it super slow so that you can accent every beat. So you would end up with something like this. So you can see I'm accenting the downbeat and it puts me 
the pattern would be, let's see. So one, three. One, three, two, four for the downbeats. And if you can accent those and really feel those and follow those along, you'll know where you are and it won't be a guessing game. You'll know right where you are the whole time. Then going up the keyboard there after that, I, I just alternate. Once I've done that first permutation pattern, I'm gonna keep that two, three, motion. And as I come up the keyboard, I'm gonna take one step with my right and then follow it with a slide or another step with my left. And that's it, that's all you really need is one graceful motion. And then I'm in position for the next section. So for that next section, what I would recommend you do is practice it first, not as triplets, but as block chords like this. Okay, and so on. And if that's a little bit tricky, I would even just practice it the octave outlines. Okay, something like that. So you can really kind of get your bearings up here and then you can worry about filling it in with the permutation pattern. Also, you notice um, I do a sticking where I do the first several, two, three, four. And then when I get down, it kind of lets me, down in the range, it kind of lets me stay put and go to one, two, three. So rather than this, where I have that extra shift, I can just do this. And I'm already right there. Okay, so that's just a sticking suggestion. You're welcome to do an extra shift if you like, but that's what I would do. For you know more musicality in this section, which is where I think you can kind of show off a little bit of rubato, a little bit of your personality, uh, where these triplets start at measure 22, it's okay to be a little bit up and down in the tempo. Not a lot, but a little. It doesn't have to be strictly in time. And you're given a couple hints as to how to do it. The writ tells you just a gentle slow down and measure 29 and then back to a tempo, the previous tempo at measure 30. So one of your main expressive tools on marimba is going to be your beating zone or your playing spot. And um, different people will give you lots of different ideas about what is best or what works or what you should do. Um, to me, the most important thing is that you know what you're doing and you're doing it with purpose. So you don't want to play in the center on the naturals and the edge on the accidentals when it's really obvious. If it's in a fast run, you can get away with it for sure. But um, if it's say the melody at the end, I would play all of that in the centers um, because I generally play in the centers. And some people might tell you to play off center. That's totally cool. If you want to play off center, play off center. Just make sure you're actually the same distance off center on every single bar, which is actually not the same distance because the bar isn't the same length. So good luck on doing those calculations as you go up the bars. But if you try and just aim for the center, you can just think about a straight line across the keyboard. So you have these two lines of the nodes and the string, and then you just have one line going down the middle, and it's really, really easy to see that bullseye lined up for you. Um, you can use them to your advantage, though. So when I want to play softer and I don't want a really full, heavy fundamental sound, and I maybe want a lighter, airier sound, I will kind of push out towards the nodes. And another tool you can use is angle. Um, almost always I'm going to try to get a direct contact with all of my percussion playing because I just think that's the fullest sound. It's the most efficient. It's the most efficient sound for the movement you're making. You're actually putting all of the energy into the bar. But if I don't want to put all the energy into the bar, then you can slightly tilt up just a little bit. And for that first piano spot in the bottom of the second page, that might actually work well if you take the time to practice it. So.
just coming up a little bit and going out towards the nodes a little bit is gonna kind of cut my sound a lot and not make me have to play so soft and walking on eggshells. Because you really do wanna draw the listener there, draw the listener in there. That's the first real piano we've had in the entire piece. And you don't wanna just blow through that. You actually wanna make it sound like the bottom sort of dropped out. So if you're getting a really good beating spot or a really full sound for the vast majority, and then suddenly there it's thinner and less, it's gonna stand out in the right way. The beating spot is more important in the extremes of the instrument. If you, as you get lower, you might wanna go more towards the off center and the lowest octave. This is only a four and a third, but if we had more room, it would make a bigger difference to not be right in the center. And on the other side of things, up here, you wanna be really pretty close to the center. If, in other words, if you're close to the note at all, especially if the mallet's not quite hard enough, you're gonna get a really framey, punchy sound, and you're not gonna get a really pure pitch and tone that you want out of the instrument. It's a warm instrument, you wanna get a warm sound, generally. In measure 34, just after that repeat, I would try this sticking, one, two, three, then two, three, four. I feel like that sticking kind of lets me move gracefully up and down the keyboard without getting stuck and having to, again, do a big shift. One, two, three, one, two, three, and have a big shift over here. It keeps my shift smaller. We have another writ at measure 39. And here, I like to kind of set this up nicely. and then suddenly faster right on the 12.8. I don't try to make it writ smoothly into the tempo of the 12.8. I actually really slow down and let it feel and sound like a new section, because that's what it is. This 12.8 section is a really cool transition into the opening material. Remember this riff on thirds? But now we have it like that, where it's two plus three. So, and uh, you're just filling in those octave right hands. The thing about the octave right hands is you're gonna be sort of set there for quite a while, right? I would not set it and forget it though, because right after that, eventually, you're gonna have to jump up to an octave up here, and look, if I don't change my interval at all, that's a ninth, not an octave. It's the very top of the range, right? So you're gonna have to compensate slightly for that shift up there. So really take your time, be patient with yourself. I had to be patient today when you're practicing the ending. Okay. That's, again, a quick sticking suggestion for you. That's how I would stick it. So I'm doing left, left, there, okay? Um, and in general, one of the rules, quote unquote, I'm sticking to, or more or less following, is that if I can have one hand play my accidentals, it's a lot easier than doing all this nonsense. You know, it's way easier to have it here and then come down, as opposed to, like I said, doing all this shifty business. The very end, we finally get that melody in octaves for the first time. Okay, so there's the octaves. Some of you guys might be tempted to do this with one-handed octaves. I wouldn't recommend it. It's pretty risky. Um, and this just needs to sound really easy. So you can really stick it on the end. Um, you got that house top accent, double forte, last note, really bring it home. You don't want to be kind of feeling like you're walking on eggshells or really have to place it carefully. Just do those hand to hands. That inside mallet, I should say, inside mallets for that. So like I said, this piece is cool because it has a bunch of different sections and all these different sections have their own feel and character to them. So. My biggest piece of advice would be to really get each one on its own, each section on its own. 
And once you feel comfortable with that, then you can start worrying about putting them together, putting these couple of transitions in there. But don't worry about trying to play it all the way down. Um, and don't worry so much about the tempos being super solid all the way through, like I said. I think this is kind of a nice choice for the Formala A2 this year because it really is more of a solo marimba piece, you know, with different sections, different characters, like I said. It's not so much just a test. Can you lay down the time and hit all the notes and all that? There's a lot more room for nuance and expression in this, so I definitely recommend you to explore that, and you're gonna have a good time with it. I've really enjoyed playing this piece, actually, so hope you do too. Thanks. <laughs>